whenever you like. I look forward to uh, to hearing. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, sir. Hear me. Okay, good, good. So, um, trying to see who's who's uh, who's here. Uh, Zenab, you're here. Hello, sir. Good afternoon. How are you? Good afternoon. Or oh, good morning. It's kind of late morning here. How are you? Oh, good morning. I'm doing well. Good, good. So, who else is here from your class? I think it's only me. Okay, well, I mean, we can start talking. Is there anything you'd particularly... People can join us if they like. Anything I particularly think, you'd like I to... I think the live... Oh, yes, of course. I have a lot of questions this time. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, one request I wanted to make. So, if it's possible, can you inform us a week before the live session? Because I think this live session was informed us day before yesterday. So, it was a very short notice. Oh, uh, right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I can certainly do that um, for next time. I also made, I, I sent a request over the weekend and uh, um, I'm sorry, it was about the short notice. Do you think more of you would come if, if, the um, notice was a bit longer. I'm sure last time I think seven or eight people attended. That's right. That's right. Okay. I'll um yeah. Uh, I'll bear that in mind. It's a good thing you told me. So let's see if others come along. You know, um, we can uh, see how they uh, if they get here or not. But I'll make a decision earlier on the next one. Maybe myself so i didn't get around to thinking about this till um to the weekend but thank you for telling me and i'll certainly do that for next time sure sir. yep i hope uh, that'll so help regarding the assignments so each mm -hmm. question should be of how many words maximum uh which assignments so the essay drafting assignments that we have received essay for... drafting have you yeah yeah um have you looked at there's only one practice assignment there's only one Practice. Yes, sir. And the draft should be about 700 to 1,000 words. Uh, in the exam, I'll do it, uh, you know, I'll send a sort of exam instruction as well beforehand. About 1,000 words, 1,200, that sort of length. 10% either is fine. All yeah. Right, so All right. so I, I guess 800, 1,200, that sort of thing. Um, and the reason for the practice assignment is that it gives you practice structuring an, an essay answer in, in the in the form that we like to have. So your voice is cutting. Oh, is it going? Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay. So um, the practice essay is really to give you practice structuring an essay uh, using the set materials, using the set sources. Uh, Structuring the argument. All right, sir. Okay, so it's kind of you've, you've got to sum up key points of ideologies or areas of two ideologies, and then that particular question: Are they compatible or not? I think that's the kind of question I've asked. Um, and it'll be similar for the essays. You know, these two ideologies are very similar, or they're not. You've got to look at both, right? Yeah. Or. One ideology must take account of the criticisms from another ideology. Yes or no? Yep, but I you must argue that, with the knowledge and the text. I'm sorry, yes, of course, that's right. Um, yeah, our oh, individualist anarchist. But uh, yes, can you see the structure that, that would be required from the document I've sent? Yes, sir, yes, I'm, I'm almost done with my assignments. It just, I was confused about the word limit. Oh right, um, roughly. I think I've said it in the in the instructions. Roughly seven hundred to a thousand or so. If I take that. I think I've misread it then again. No issue. Yeah. I'll look into it again. Sure, sure. Have a look, and if you've got questions, you can email, email. Of course, by all means. Um, anything else you'd like to raise? Uh, sir, I have a lot of questions regarding this last week topic: mm -hmm. of structuralism and postmodernism. Yes. Yeah. 
So my first question would be, what do you mean? Like, can you explain in briefly about structuralism period and modernism period? Because since we are talking about post structural structuralism and post modernism. Sure. 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 Have you read um, the transcript or the chapter in the book? Yes, sir. Um, on post structuralism, uh, I think I've, I've set out an account of the critique of structuralism with some examples. Uh, certainly, Murdoch and Althusser, they're the examples that, that I've seen. Uh, oh, it's cutting a lot. Oh, it's cutting out, is it? Let me yeah. um, If I cut out the video, we may get better bandwidth. Let me try that. Sure. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, let's try that and see. Video is, of course, uh, right. Do you, do you remember? Have you read the, the transcripts or the chapter in the book? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, can you recall uh, the criticisms that that have been made by, by Derrida in particular of particular structural theories or structuralist theories? Yes, I have doubts on his theories as well. I have seen other videos of it on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it didn't really clear my mind. Or my okay, doubt. sure, sure. Okay, what do you think structuralism is? I think it means. So, as much as I understand, structuralism theory are based on research, academic research, in particularly to yeah to take a matter and yeah. structure it in a way so that all of it combines in one meaning. There is a, there's only one meaning to it. Okay, that's not, I mean, no, you're on, you're going in the right direction, but uh, think of, do you remember uh, Derrida was particularly criticizing Claude Lévi-Strauss? Yeah, it was Strauss in French. Um, now, Lévi-Strauss was an anthropologist. He broadly thought that all societies displayed similar structures, in particular the family. Well, I think David Strauss was, was talking about the incest table, wasn't he? And he said that's an example of how all societies have similar structure, say in respect of the, of the ban on incest. Yeah, um, the Australia, yeah. Uh, um, the, uh, so that's, a, you know, that's, if you like, a structural feature of all families in all societies, so Levi Strauss said. Today, we might think rather differently, knowing what we know about the extent of sexual abuse, abuse within, within the family and outside it as well. But uh, um, Murdoch, for example, GP Murdoch after the war, all, family, all societies had families and families had a similar structure throughout or a similar organization. So can you see how these are structuralist theories? Okay. Yeah. In other words, what they're saying is that the family is of all societies and internally the family has a similar pattern of organization throughout all societies. And people like Murdoch and Lady Sloss did actually go out and, and examine societies in the light of that theory. I mentioned uh, Louis Althusser, the French structuralist Marxist. He later gave up structuralist Marxism. He, of course, he, he read Marx extremely well. He was a great Marx scholar. Uh, and he concluded that economic structure of societies explained everything that happened within them. And so that's the explanatory theory, and it's structural theory. You must look at the economic structure and nothing else. Okay, he later gave that up. It's highly problematic. And that is itself a structuralist theory. We can explain all societies by looking at their economic structure. So we can't hear. Does that help? Oh, I'll try again. How far? How far could you hear me? Economic structure. Yes. Okay. Quite simply, um, there is a form of. Not to say, I was a great adherent of it and great propagator of it for a long time. He later gave it up, but while he was a structuralist, he said. Only way to 
understand the working of society and the organization of society is to look at the economic structure. The economic system explains the whole lot in every culture all over the world. Yeah? So that becomes a structural element of okay. the economic of society. So does there is a linkage between structuralism and conservatism? That's a very good question indeed. What do you think? I think some of the points that have been made in structuralism mm -hmm. are very similar to the points made in conservatism. For example, oh. that the women's role in family has always been about taking care of the household and children. And in mm -hmm. structuralism also I've read that uh, they portray the same uh, roles of women in the household and not in the industrial world. Right. Yes, that's that's a very good point. Yes, they can certainly. Um, there are elements of conservatism in, for example, Marxism. Uh, of course, they want to change that, but it's a very good point you've made that uh, accepting that all societies have a similar structure or that in order to understand all societies, we must look at the economic structure first and foremost, it does have a conservative element. There's an element, you know, an implication of acceptance. Now with Marxist, structuralist Marxism, that is not automatically the case because structuralist Marxists say, well, look, this is also a highly oppressive system. We need to put in place a better economic structure that does not restrict humans' creativity in the way that capitalism does. But they still rely on the idea of economic structure as the crucial, the crucial factor and the overriding factor. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. So what would yeah. be the main theme in structuralism? Like in Marxism, we have a main theme. In conservatism, we have a main theme that what has been going on uh, in the past mm. shall go on in the future. And Marxism realized most of the theories are based on capitalism. So what would be the main theory? Like if I had to explain structuralism in one word or in one sentence, what would that be? Sure, sure. There is there is no one form of structuralism. Remember the structuralism theology and sociology in, in some form of Marxist theory. I would say, of course, is the great uh, example of that. What we do, what, what you need to do is look at the particular theories that are being advanced and see they are structuralist in form or not, and also see if structuralism can explain, oh, this form of structuralism or structuralism as a form can explain the phenomenon they're trying to explain. For example, a lot of people who criticized structuralist Marxism will say, hold on, um, plenty of societies have a similar economic structure, but vastly different. Uh, they may have a variety of faiths, and these elements in human action and in the understanding of human society. Similarly, people who have criticized um, Murdoch's family or, um, or uh, maybe close on, on the incest taboo would say, well, hold on, um, let's look a bit more closely. We may find this plenty of in societies anyway. And it's quite likely we also find them, this is now common knowledge, um, that families take very different forms in very different systems. Uh, they, they don't have to take the same form. Not all societies have the same concept of the family either. Yeah? So, uh, for example, I have a cousin from, uh, he's born in Madras like me, we still call it, I still call him a long time ago, and he lives quite near me here in the UK. And he's really a sort of history. Um, but as far as we're concerned, we're still cousins. And that might well be a surprise to people who are brought up in nuclear families in that he and I still think of each other as family. Does that make sense? So I couldn't hear you. Can you repeat? Yeah, okay. I have a distant relation who lives quite not far from me in the UK. Uh, but as far as we're concerned, we're cousins. And in, right, in contemporary Indian families, there's nothing unusual about that. Nothing unusual about that. 
but that may be a surprise to people who've been brought up in nuclear families in post-war industrial societies, right? Oh, right, but he's quite a distant relative. Well, yes, as far as I'm concerned, and, and I am as far as he's concerned. Um, the family doesn't have to take a single form, and it means different things in different societies. And that means that a kind of family in all societies and its role in all societies is a strict vision, but it's also a very limited one. Yeah, and it's simply not the case. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yeah, so structuralism is the form of a number of theories. In economics, in so society, and so sociology, and anthropology, or whatever, or in politics, right? Um, yet it's highly problematic. And what we owe to Derrida is that he he provided a very powerful critique of structuralist theories. Okay, there are problems in Derrida's own work, and I've covered some of these in the in the um, in the uh, transcripts and the, the book in the lecture. Does that help? So, yes, sir. So one of the main arguments of his is mm -hmm. uh, the structure in that I'm reading from the transcript that he calls the center of any structure or the organizing principle of not itself yeah. part of the structure. So he goes yeah. on, concludes that the center of an explanatory system is what he calls therefore a non-present. So can you explain what does this mean? Especially by non what do you think? What, what do you think it means? If I don't what point. Sorry, sir? What do you think it means? So, as much as I understood from it, that means that structure is theory of those who believe in it. They can't, they explain the structure is form, but instead of explaining that structure is form, they start explaining some other other thing. So in the end, both of them does not really match each other or does not really uh, interpret what they wanted to interpret at the first. That's a very good point. Okay, Derrida's critique of structuralism is that he says, yes, all structures, any structural theory has an important principle. You know, it may be economics as the, as the overriding principle of society. It may be the family as the as a sort of un unit in all societies, that kind of thing. But when we actually look for, can we point to something and say, there it is in, well, no, because the structure is made up of interrelated elements, right? Think of a physical structure, you know, beams and timbers joining, making up a house and so on, or reinforced concrete and pillars and things and floors making up a house. Yes, the building has a certain shape and form, and has certain spaces and it's held up by certain structural but can we point to an object and say that's the organizing principle of it? Yeah, the point is we can't. The organizing principle is shown in the organization of the system or the building. It says, Therefore, it's not actually a physical presence. It's not an object we can point to. Does that make sense? But so then how would we explain something or anything in general? It oh, we can explain it. He does got no problem with that. We can explain it, yes. But we can't point to you know, a physical organizing principle the way that we might point to, say, you know, the pedals on the bicycle or the chain or the brakes. These are not, those are physical elements when they're organized in a certain way. We get a bicycle, right? But right. where's the organizing principle of the bicycle? Well, it's in the way the elements of the bicycle are connected to each other, right? So it's not a physical presence, it's something that is manifested. Does that make sense? I'm getting to it. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the point there is Derrida, and you'll find this, if, have you read the whole chapter? Postmodernism or all the lectures? It's yes, all open. Okay. Post uh, which is what we're talking about. Um, Derrida, we have to remember, is um, 
responding to major problems in the linguistic theory put forward by Saussure of the late 19th and early 20th century. Now, Saussure says that words, the word is the signifier and the object is the signifier. Sounds very good, but what notices the is that, is cracking a lot. Oh, right. Can you hear me now? I can hear you, but the moment you start explaining, the your voice cracks. I think there's something wrong oh, right. with your microphone. Um, I don't, so don't think so. The volume's up. Um, the the properly here, as far as I can tell. Uh, I close the video down. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, I'll try and slow it down. That may also make a difference. Mike. Derrida, among other things, is what he sees as a structuralist theory of language proposed by Saussure, a French linguist, in the late 19th, early 20th century. Now, Saussure says the word is the signifier. The object which it signifies is the signified. Now, Derrida is rightly very uncomfortable about this. Surely, language itself and systems of meaning gain their coherence from their relationships to each other. You know, we can arrange words in a sentence, and if we get the order wrong, we make no sense. Right. Now, Derrida says language doesn't work on the model of signifier and signified. So his work is a continued dialogue with Saussure, and I've mentioned that in the, the, uh, the chapter and in the transcripts in the, in the lectures. So as a result of that, a lot of people have said, hey, hold on, also apply to any structuralist theory. Right? There is, you can't identify the organizing principle as some object or object we can point to. The point is the interrelationship of the elements, right? And on top of that, it's not clear. I mean, it's simply not the case that all societies have an incestible, they pretend to have, right? Or that all societies have a similar family structure of family, or even that all societies have identifiable families in the ways that some do and some don't, uh, that some do, yeah? So, uh, it's easy to be sidetracked, I, I say sidetracked, it's easy to forget that Derrida's critique starts with Saussure and he's involved in a long dialogue with Saussure throughout his work. Yeah? But um, you've raised a very important point about not being able to, to see the organizing principle. The principle is shown in the interrelationship of the elements in any theory or system. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yeah, so I hope that helps. And if you go back to the chapter, I hope that will help you to see what's going on there. Yeah. I hope that helps. Yes, sir. I'm yeah. coming to this term of textuality or text. Yes, yeah. So what does his work actually define text as? Right. Again, um, you'll find that um, uh, if, you, if, have you, if you go back through the lectures, it's a very good question. Derrida says the way to explain and it, you know, way to understand a, you know, a book <coughs> or a work of art or an explanatory theory is to see what went into making up and what was rejected on the way as well, not just what was included, but what was rejected. So now, historically, in the process of creation of works, he's absolutely right. You think of all the, of the your essay drafts, or you know, when you do a draft piece of work and then write a final piece of work and hand it in or whatever, or publish it or whatever. Bender says that a complete understanding of a work is only possible when we look at what was rejected, you know, the half half start or botch ups, oh no, that's rubbish. Or, or uh, you know, we come up with a, a report of a scientific experiment or a piece of lab research. 
What about the false starts? We've made, oh, crikey, we've got to give that up, or God, we made a mess of that experiment, we've got to do it again. What Derrida is saying is that the final product uh, doesn't give us a complete sense of its history, of its creation, of everything that was rejected, as well as everything that was included. Uh, and therefore, he says, um, there is no outside to the text, in the other, or text, or in the other text, which is a very baffling comment. It's actually at the end of a long passage in the book called The Grammatology. Uh, I think that's the source. Now, the problem with that is that we have to be clear what was relevant. You know, suppose it was raining on the day I wrote a famous piece of work, right? Or completed a chapter or something. What difference does that make? It might make a difference, right? But we have to show that it makes a difference or not. And Derrida seems not to get that point. He seems not to realize that he's leaving us without the requirement for relevance. You know, does it make a difference that I've seen such and such a bird in my garden this morning? Does it make a difference to the explanation we are covering of the particular theories in this course? If it does, show us the, show us the relevance, show us the connection. Does that make sense? Right, sir. So according yeah, to the test yeah, is sorry. as important. Oh, sorry. Can I repeat? Go ahead. Go ahead. So according to him, the process is as much as important as the final product or final thesis. Is. The process is essential to un to our understanding the work in a sense. Now, this is highly problematic. We are. There are times when it is important, and I've seen it done. I'll give you a brief example, which I give um, in my classes, or used to give in my classes on campus. A very long time ago, I heard a famous conductor, Andre, um, came from New York, jazz pianist. He was conducting one of the world's great orchestras, the LSO, London Symphony Orchestra. And on a Sunday, they all went in, at a live session with the television cameras and so on, uh, looking at um, the drama work that Beethoven wrote for the end of his, it's a very great work, you've probably heard it, or it doesn't matter if you have or haven't. And there's a famous tune at the end called Andy Freud, it's a setting of, of a poem by Schiller. And, um, oh, to joy. And um, some Beethoven made set this to music were really like, almost like nursery rhymes. Kevin called them Teddy Bear's Picnic. Now, Yes, it's very interesting learning all that. We learn something about the struggle and the difficulty of creation of great works, yes. But um, these are additional to our understanding of the work. You know, we can listen to the work, and I, until I watched that program, no idea that, that the creation of the work had been such an issue, such a difficult and complex issue for Beethoven. There'd be so many, you know, bits that he scribbled and threw on the floor or threw in the bin. Luckily, we still have now, what Derrida is saying is that we've got to include all that in our idea of the work. Well, yes, but in what way does this explain the final work and how does it add to our understanding of it? Um, Derrida doesn't seem to realize that question. What's the connection between the rubbish that got thrown away on the floor or, you know, dumped in the bin and the final work? Uh, and in what way does it add to our understanding? All that can be specified. Derrida doesn't seem to see that those questions do arise. Uh, and then what is a complete understanding? The fact that it's a sunny day outside, but, you know, fine, it's very nice. But does that give us a complete explanation? Is it necessary for that in saying the discussion of our conversation today? Does that make sense? Yes, sir. I hope so, yeah? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, so your so example... Yeah. So your example of William Shakespeare, Julius Caesar yes. also knew that. That I remembered, I studied it in yes. school and I remember a whole lot of different story or a different viewpoint. But when yeah. it was the first time I'm, I was hearing about Caesar being the illeg illegitimate son, so the whole viewpoint or the whole meaning of the story shifted to a by a lot. Well, Brutus, if Brutus was Yeah, yeah. You know, when, yeah. when, when Caesar says, et tu, Brute, 
Um, and the line can be played in so many different ways. But if this is the case, I mean, I'm not saying it is the case. I've seen it suggested, right? Yeah. Um, and if it was the case, would it make a difference to our reading of, of the play? Yes, of course it would, or to that particular passage and so on. Of course it would. But the point is that that is a highly pertinent fact. Was it a sunny or a rainy day when, when Caesar was assassinated? Does that make a difference? Terry doesn't seem to realize that that kind of question needs to be addressed. Yeah? I've seen the play play very, very differently. One, uh, utter horror on Caesar's face. Et tu, you know, and you, you too, um, and so on. It could be played in very, very many different ways. Um, and it could be that if, if this were the case, Brutus was his illegitimate son, then perhaps we, you know, we have to rethink. But whether it was a sunny day or a rainy day or or whatever. Um, and if, if Brutus was the illegitimate son, does, who, who, was, who was his mother? Does that make a difference to our understanding of the play? And so on. So I just remember a few years back, uh, I think, that, yeah. I, I mean, a few decades back, the entire theory regarding the Romeo Juliet story being a romantic one was flipped around and said that William Shakespeare was in fact portraying the toxicity of love, not romanticizing it. He was against the whole concept of uh, the uh, love between youngsters. And the whole theory of Romeo and Juliet was shifted up by a lot of things. So instead, sure. the, play, mm -hmm. uh, the play showing the romantic version of people started seeing it as a more negative form of it. Right. Now, what's your reaction to that reading of the play? Mine. Now I have to mm. read it again because this was exactly. the first time I'm re hearing Brutus being the illegitimate son. Yeah, yeah, sure. The point I'm reaching for is this that we will read works in an indefinite range of ways, but we have to show our reading and justify it by reference to the text or to significant other material. We've got to show the significance of the other material. Now, it could be that when we reread, you know, Romeo and Juliet, I mean, we, we see that this is actually an allegory about the toxicity of love. Yes, of this kind of love. Yeah, sure. But show it, show that to us in the text. Okay? It may be that Shakespeare had seen an episode or been involved in an episode in his own life and wrote the thing as a result, but we'd have to show the connection. Does that make sense? Right, so. So, yeah, but, and yeah. Derrida seems to leave us without a requirement for that. So if there are way too many interpretations or meaning of one single, for example, a play, won't it lose its essence or the whole meaning of it? Right. Is there such a thing as an essence at all? Um, have, have a look at the, 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 the chapter, about the section on postmodernism. The idea of an essence is itself highly problematic. Highly problematic, right. but you're raising a very good question, and there's a lot of work in philosophical aesthetics around that. I've referred to some of that in 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 the uh, particular chapter <coughs> in the section on post on postmodernism. But you're you're raising a very good point. Uh, can we um, invite questions? Is it all right with you, Zainab? Can we invite questions from your other classmates? One or two have joined us. Sure, sure, sure. I, I'm really sorry. I didn't see. No, no, Someone not at all. Going to know, not. I was going so immersed right in my lecture. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Not at all. You're doing the right thing raising the questions. Would anyone else like to raise the questions? Don't worry if you haven't any questions. You can write them or speak them as you wish. I see who's... Uh... Oh, yes, okay. Can I look at the chat lines? Um... Yeah, um, there's a question here. Uh, is that from Sneha? On, um, can you hear me, Sneha? Oh, right, she hasn't got audio. That's quite, okay, let me see what I can do. The question is this, for everyone who can hear me. Um, 
it's an essential form, it, you know, it's, a, it's mentioned that an essentialist form of ecofeminism would create a society which is nurturing and caring, but isn't that contradictory to the idea of feminism that challenges the traditional concepts of women's roles? Okay, well, uh, there are forms of ecofeminism which, uh, which see our destruction of the environment as a very masculine, very masculine matter. And eco there are strands in ecofeminism which say that, or which, yeah, broadly say that there's such a thing as feminist ecology, which is far more nurturing and caring of the, of the natural environment and by implication of society. Well, it is not contradictory to feminism because it's challenging our traditional concepts of society, but an implication here is that society should be organized by by women and it would be a much more caring perhaps less violent much more nurturing society yeah um and i i hope that answers your point it's a very good point we would no doubt have to rethink women's roles in an eco-feminist society because women would be if you like the main determining and shaping agents um and of course, our world would look very, very different if it were shaped and run by women, no doubt about that. Um, so so uh, uh, there would be some aspects of this that, that go with this traditional sense of women as naturally nurturing and caring. But there are aspects of ecofeminism which challenge those saying, well, look, we need to organize the whole of life on these lines. Look at what men have done, look at the mess men have made of it. Yeah. Okay. Sneha, I hope you can hear me. Um i I'm not sure quite what to do. Uh perhaps you can send an email to the to the forum and I'll try and reply. Yeah, it's a real pity. It's a good question. It's a good question. Feminism challenges. Yes, yes, feminism does challenge that. And ecofeminism would certainly also challenge the idea that women's role is in, in, in the home um, and nowhere else. Yeah. So ecofeminism would mean a complete reorganization of the whole of society, the whole of our economy. Um, instead of seeing the you know, natural resources as things to be exploited, we're now faced with this. We've exploited the world very nearly to destruction. We may yet destroy much of life on the planet because of what we've done. Instead, right, we need to think far more in terms of using less, replacing more, we can we can burn out quite a lot of our natural resources just like that very quickly. Nobody's talking about how much oil there is, right? There are different accounts of how much oil is left, but it takes, as far as I know, tens or hundreds of millions of years to to create that oil for natural processes to create that oil. So um, perhaps an ecofeminist would say, "Look, hold on, we do need it, but we need to think very differently about energy, how we use it, where the the heat goes." Ultimately, all, all energy degrades into heat. Where does that go? Um, and we might say that eco, an eco-feminist society or a society run on eco-feminist lines would really look vastly different and we would need women in far more influential and substantial roles throughout society, not just in the family. Hope that helps. Okay, anyone else like to raise any points? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, it helped. Yes, Thank they you. Oh, you're there. Good, good. Nice to, nice to hear you. Shyam, you want to 
question. Feminists are more concerned about domestic violence, harassment, pay gap. Okay, what's your what is your response to that? What's everyone else's reaction to Sham's point? Can you see Sham's point in the chat? Uh, yes, sir. Response to previous comment only at I believe okay. it's not restricted to one particular point, but where it's was paid for place or their own human rights mm -hmm. and so on. I'm not sure I understand you very clearly. If I've understood you correctly, yes, you're absolutely right. That means uh, absolutely right to be concerned about domestic violence and harassment, about the obscene pay gaps and op career opportunities and all the rest of it, and about reproductive rights. By the way, in the United States, under states' rights in the Constitution, the 10th Amendment, um, a great many states are severely restricting women's reproductive rights as well as abortion rights. So have a look at some of the American press, you'll see this happening. Um, so yes, feminists are right to be concerned about that, but that's one of the things they are concerned about. Um, and it's not the only thing. We might then say, okay, how should we reorganize society in the light of these concerns? And that would then look very different. You know, we would almost certainly have far better childcare um, arrangements so women didn't have to give up their work and we would have very different duties for men and women so that men played a far greater role in buying the house and in bringing children up and in physically caring for them. It takes enormous time and effort, as we know. Yeah, I hope that helps, Sham. Feminism reaches into every area of life in whatever form it takes, whatever form feminism takes. Does that help? Okay. You're raising very good questions. Have another look at the chapter or the transcripts, and I hope those will help you to, to clear, clarify your questions, clarify the points you've raised in the light of what we've said in this discussion. Anyone like to add anything else? So do we have more time or is it time up? Oh, no, it's not a quarter of an hour. I mean, it's your time. If you'd like to call a halt, we call a halt. If you'd like to continue talking, we, we continue talking. So I'm all right with any time. Okay, any, I mean, anyone else like to raise a point or a question? Have you found what I've said helpful? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, and if it isn't helpful, please say so, because that means, you know, I need to rethink what I've said. I have a question. Yes, go ahead, go ahead. In Kerala, sir, can you hear yeah. me? Yes, yes. Yes, I can hear you. Yep, go ahead, Sneha. Uh, Fred, I can't hear you. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, in okay, Kerala, uh, yeah. hybrid uh, rail project is proposed by the government, but uh, the main argument against this project is the ecological sensitivity of Kerala. And an alternative suggested is um, developing more airports and uh, establishing a better inter-district air travel facilities. So um, whenever a project is proposed, there will be an issue of the current ecological problem with the yeah. future ecological environmental issues. So how yes. can we address this conflict? It's a very good point. Um, we do need um, re reliable scientific information. Now, as far as I know, air travel is one of the greatest contributors to rapid 
to the yeah. rapid accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And the rapid rise in air travel before the pandemic meant that air travel was a really serious issue. Um, certainly, uh, France has now banned short haul flights internally, right? Fine, banned them. And it, that didn't get enough as much attention as it might have done. Um, partly for ecological reasons, partly because of you know, aviation fuel prices, but they banned them. The European Union has a high speed rail, net, rail network, which has been going for a long time. France is a great leader in, in high speed railways. Um, and uh, I've been on the Eurostar uh, to Paris, and uh, it travels at 300 kilometers an hour across southern England and across much of northern France, 185 miles an hour, 186, I think. So, um, high speed railways, well, above about 140 miles an hour, I gather they're very expensive because of the um, the power that's needed and um, the rail and the um, the kind of track that's needed, but railways are a unbelievably good way to transport large numbers of passengers and freight. Um, we get signs here in my in my city where I live, Southampton, my, which has been my home for a long time. Uh, a sign: uh, the university set up their own bus service, which it's a public bus service; everyone can use it. Um, called Unilink. And I've seen signs on, uh, on the side of Unilink bus saying one full bus takes 75 cars off the road, right? So um, there are ways we're having to think very hard about public transport um, and perhaps even about how we organize our economy so that people don't live too far from work. Um, the, certainly our current climate catastrophe, we're, we're already in the middle of it. I may be exaggerating a bit, I don't know, but the dangers we face are very, very serious. And so a great deal depends on what is said about, about new proposals. Certainly, expanding air travel, as I see it, is not the answer. I know it's very nice, and I do fly and so on. I'm as guilty as anyone. But for example, I wouldn't fly between um, uh, Chennai and, and Bangalore if the trains were quicker. I was very surprised to find that 320 kilometers takes about seven hours. And in many other parts of the world, in the industrial world, that, that uh, you know, the trains aren't necessarily screaming along all the time, but seven hours to travel 320 kilometers, 210 miles, whatever it is, um, 200 miles. Uh, so we do need to think very hard about, about how we transport large numbers of people, how far we transport them, uh, and so on. Um, have you heard of the, the last mile issue? Have you heard of that one? Uh, Quite often. Yeah, I'll give you an example. I've seen it myself. I, I used to live in, uh, in Besanagar in, in um, you know, quite near, um, well, I was working on the Hindu at the time, and I used the MRTS. I've written an article, it was December 2000, November, December 2007, on using it. And the, it was a single line, you know, so called supposed mass transport system. And um, I wrote a, a lighthearted article on it, uh, on using it. But the real issue for me was it took me from, it took me uh, 15 kilometers, I think, in about 20 minutes. It was really a nice thing to use. The station um, was very near the office, the Hindu office, seven minutes walk, very easy. I had a, a monthly season ticket. It was getting home because it was, I think a good couple of miles or mile and a half from home. Uh, there were no direct buses. There was a very difficult junction to cross if I wanted to get a bus back to my place. And there were no buses on the route that would have been much, much closer uh, to my place. I also learned that they had to build a line on the route they did. It doesn't go through too many centers of population in the city because they couldn't um, get land acquisition permits. Um, and people were saying, no, we're not selling. We want billions and billions of rupees for it uh, if we're going to sell the land and so on. And that meant the line had to follow a particular route. I learned this from a railway engineer who's married to a cousin of mine, um, a very senior railway, railway officer. Um, and he was telling me about this. So we have to think very hard about the ways we organize transport. Uh, you know, why is it that we didn't build these surface railways 60 years ago, 70 years ago at the time of independence? Or it's now well, you know, 80, 75 years, why didn't people do that? 
most of the great industrial cities in industrial countries use surface railways because metros are very expensive um, and people use them all the time. And when I worked in London and commuted in from South London on the, um, on the train, suburban train. Uh, and I live near a suburban, suburban station where I am and use it quite a lot. Um, so you've raised a very good point. Uh, you might want to look at the discourse around the plans for Kerala and see what's being said. Have a look at the Greenpeace. Have you looked at Greenpeace India? Have a look at their website. Okay, sir. Thank you. Try that. But think about, and you'll find a lot of very good material on the net, not just from environmental campaigning groups. Remember, a lot of industries are now thinking about trying to curb curb um, their environmental the damage they do. And then you might want to locate that in, in theories of deep ecology or shallow ecology. Right? Can we all tra transform our lives? That would be deep ecology. Transform our productive systems completely. Or can we, should we just do the same things but do them in, in more environmentally sound ways? Yeah. But it's a very interesting issue you've raised, and it will affect all of us. I haven't a car in the UK. haven't had one for 35 years. Right? We, I've got a bicycle, which we don't use very much, or we have a bicycle. We walk to the local shops, carry things. I, I um, you know, sometimes use the buses, but they're also quite expensive. Um, so walk into town, 40 minutes an hour and back. Easier in this kind of climate, but in, you know, on very raw winter days, not easy. Um, so green belts around industry, yes, they've been done in the industrial world. And people say, well, look, stop, stop um, allocating green belt for building. Use existing brownfield, they call them brownfield sites within cities. Yeah. So um, you're raising very significant questions. There's a lot of literature around these. Try reading um, George Monbio. He's a British environmentalist, a former professor of philosophy, a lecturer in philosophy at um, Oxford, and one of the world's great environmentalist writing in English. He's very sharp. Uh, there's a look at his uh, Sperry lecture. I think I referred to it in in the transcripts and in the book. University of Sheffield, 2013. His name's French, M O N B I O T, George Monbiot. He's British. Um, have a look at the Sperry lecture, and he talks about putting a value on nature. What sense does that make? And these these kinds of issues arise whenever major environmental projects or ma major projects are discussed. Yeah. Um, have a look at those and, and see what you make of them. There's a lot of literature around this, and there will be more. It's it's very urgent. It, we all face it. There's no escaping. There's no planet B. Does that help? SOS, is anyone there? Yes, sir. Okay. Anyone like to raise any other points? If I'm talking too much, tell me. And if you'd like to raise something, say so. Yeah. Do you find these discussions helpful? Yes, sir. I hope so. It's good that you've come with questions. Right, excellent that you've come with your own questions. First class, because your questions, and I hope the answers will help you make sense of the questions or clarify them. Let me give you a story, a little story. Um, after I took my degree in philosophy, philosophy and sociology, I shared a flat for a time with somebody who took his degree a, a year or two later, called William, very, very fine mind indeed. Immense professional thinking. He was also an artist. And we mentioned a certain lecturer. He was um, American, called Guy Robinson. He actually looked a bit like um, Andre Previn, conductor, musician. And uh, William and I had both done Guy's um, uh, philosophy of science and social science course, which he shared with a lecturer called Graham Young. And William told me that when he'd done the course, the very first lecture, Guy Robinson had come in and sat down at the desk. He always sat down. Uh, he didn't stand the lecture. He said, right. I can't do the New York Castle. If you haven't got any questions, I haven't got any to say. And I said, how did the class take it? So William said, 
He was absolutely, he was absolutely right. And you see, the, you know, I'll just tell you the story. I said it to a T once and they were fine. I said, don't worry, I will, you know, go through the course and so on. But your questions, well, you'll engage with them because they're your questions. Okay. And that's why I'm so glad to, to receive your questions. I hope they didn't bother you at all. No, no, I won the questions. I once met a great, a very great Marx scholar called uh, Istvan Mesaro. She was professor at Sussex and he came to Southampton to, so after I had my, to go to the philosophy seminars, which were in the evenings, once a week or once a fortnight. And uh, afterwards at an informal dinner, I asked Mesarosh what was Lukash like, because he was a student of Georg Lukash in, in Hungary, the, the, one of the great giants of Marx scholarship, were real giants. And he said, Lukash never made you feel you'd asked a silly question. And I thought, what a wonderful thing. Maybe I'd asked a very silly question, but I learned the lesson, you know, I thought, and my own tutors were like that. If you had a question, they would try and address it. So, uh, Ask your questions. Do you think it makes more sense to you? If you ask a question, you get a response. Absolutely. Um, so I got this habit yeah. from school. One of my professors used to always say this, especially when he noticed yeah. at the beginning, I wouldn't ask, ask any question. So he used to say uh -huh. to me that Zainab, if you have no questions regarding any topic, that, that means that you did not understand it. It's impossible for someone to not have a question after reading about any chapter. So if you That's want to right. really know that if you understood the chapter or not, you should have a question. If you don't have a question, go read it again. Even if that question is one plus one is equal to two or not, how silly it may sound yeah. to you, but your question might help someone else and it will help you as well. So from that, I have a habit of asking questions a lot. <laughs> That's a very good point. Is that from school or from, from college? So from school. School, right? What a, what a teacher, what a remarkable teacher. Uh, remember also one plus one equals two uh, is the kind of thing that has been addressed in a great many works on the philosophy of mathematics. <laughs> so it's not a silly question, whatever else. How is it that one plus one equals two, my gosh. That's a terrific question, but yes, I take the point. But ask the questions. I would say this to, to everyone. Got a question, ask it. And that'll help you engage with the subject. Yeah? Yes. Anyone else like to raise a point? So I wanted to oh. ask a clear dot, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. But sir, what I've, uh, I'm really going to the week nine, uh, week 10, the fundamentalism and theocracy, what I've understood so far is that the yeah. main or the striking difference that I can get from these two theories is fundamentalism revolves around political, uh, political society, like the political aspect of a religion. Mm -hmm. And theocracy revolves totally around the religion. That's that well. Right? The, the, yes, you're not far off. Remember the and retreatist forms of fundamentalism, the Amish in New England um, since the 17th century, perhaps even earlier. And I've mentioned them in the lectures and in the book. That's a very good point. Most forms of fundamentalism are aggressively political and they seek to reshape society along their lines. Theocracy is a society or a state that is organized specifically on theocratic, on the lines of the faith involved, right? Yes, there are some overlaps, but most forms of fundamental, uh, fundamentalism are aggressively, often militantly political, most forms. Right. Yeah, they don't, they don't have to be. You can be fundamentalist and completely retreatist. You know, I turn my back on you know, with the smartphones and the consumer goods and the air, air travel. I live a completely peaceful life and talk to nobody and fundamentally, fundamentalist. I mean, you know, my faith is made up of just two or three, a handful of propositions and that's it. So fundamentalism has to do with the way faith is organized. Most people are also highly political. Theocracies are societies which are states in which the whole of society is organized on the lines of a particular faith. Does that help? Yes, sir. 
hope so. Have a look at the, the transcripts again or listen to the, the lectures again or read the book. Um, there's plenty of material being written about this kind of thing publicly. If you're interested, I'll send some links as I come across them to the, you know, post them on the forum. So, so given the present situation, do we see a more of fundamentalist society or a theocracy society? Very good question. There are not that many theocracies in the world. But, um, uh, at, at the chat, at the transcripts or the lectures again. There are not that many theocracies. The obvious example is the state, but um, but there are not many explicit theocracies. There are plenty that seem to be going in the theocratic direction, but that's often a result of powerful fundamentalist developments within them. Um, uh, India hasn't now has no um, Afghan border, but take a look at what's happening in Afghanistan and have a look at the international press because they are carrying material on it. You see in the item that secondary schools for girls have been closed again. Yes, sir. Yeah, so take a look at that. Um, have a look at the international press. I mean, some of the English are covering this in, in quite a lot of detail. Just a couple of articles, have a look and see. Yeah, I hope that will help you with the kinds of questions you've raised. Sure, sir. So, yeah. so can we say that fundamental fundamentalism has arised from theocracy? Good question. I don't know the answer. Nobody's ever asked me that before. Uh, theocracy, theocracies are often quite complex and they're not necessarily as rigid as they're made out to be. And you'll find that covered in, in the lectures. Um, fundamentalism is explicitly a matter of expressing major complex faiths in, in you know, reducing to, to a handful of propositions, so the so-called fundamentals. So, yes, some fundamentalisms may turn into theocracy but that then means being sure that the faith is organized on particular, that a society is organized on particular religious lines. Let me that. Fundamentalist movements tend to accept no arguments, right? Because we've got to stick to the fundamentals and nothing else. Right? I hope that helps. Yes, sir. Have another, in, in the light of your questions, have another look at the the lectures um, or, or read the trial. Another look at that. And you will find material written on this and um, cited some of it um, in the transcripts in the book. Yeah? yeah. Uh, for example, there's a, a very good article in the Atlantic Monthly, which I think is accessed by somebody called Wood, I think. And um, it was on what, what ISIS really about two or three years ago. Have a look at that one. It's quite long. Yeah. Um, and you may find some surprises in there. I will. Yeah, I think I've cited it in the lectures, but I can't look. Yeah. Yes, name of wood. In the Atlantic Monthly, very high quality, you know, of a lot of things. Okay. Well, time's gone by. Mr. Balaji's time, he's kindly given us. Um, I hope you found this discussion worthwhile. I'll try and give you more notice for next Say the week yes. before. Yeah, I'll try and get um, a debate soon and we'll, uh, we'll meet perhaps in week 11 or week 12. Okay. All and right. uh, if, I, if I'm talking too much, tell me. If you want to say no, more. No, not at all. Sir. I was worried. I was asking. I was going to ask way too many questions. No, no. You must ask the questions. You learn. And I'm sure your, your classmates also learn. Um, because you're all asking very good, very decisive questions. Right? Thank you so and much, sir. Any question? Ask the question. If you have it, ask it. Sure. Okay. Well, we'll meet next time. Nice to meet all of you again. Sure, sir. And many Thank thanks you. to Mr. Balaji. Many thanks, Mr. Balaji, for your trouble. Yep. For organizing this so nicely. Okay. So we'll meet again. Right? Go safely. Thank you for having us, sir. Go safely, everyone. Glad to meet you. And glad to catch up with you again. All the best.